Yes. Cameron, you have your hand up? I do. Um, have we hit record yet? I'm okay. just starting it right now. Okay. I want to capture every salient detail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. You're we welcome. Were just, we're just introducing ourselves. Thank you. Carry on. Tyler? Tyler Dickey, Bend and Peel style. Uh, Toby Mark, City of Bend. Ariel Mendez, uh, Bend City Council. Barb Campbell, Bend City Council and Chair of the MPO. Have we got somebody filling in for Phil for the beginning of the meeting? That would be me. Okay, Chris great. Hi, Chris. Great. So let's go ahead. And so we have Chris from Deschutes County online. Anybody else online we should know about? Bob is not here today. Bob um, Oda is being very capably represented by Rick Williams, who just stepped outside for a moment. <laughs> um, uh, Tyler, you want to take us through hybrid meeting guidelines? Yeah, I will be brief. You know, I think everybody's pretty familiar with this. If you have any questions, there's a raise hand function for those online. And, and there's also, if you're on the phone, you can use the star nine to uh, raise your hand and join us. And this meeting is being recorded. And if you want a live transcript, you just hit the button, I believe, at the bottom of the screen to live action. Great, thank you. Our next agenda item is public comment. If we've got anyone who would like to make a comment to this board, Anybody online? All right, thank you. The next item is the meeting minutes from the March 17th, 2023 policy board meeting. I would accept a motion to approve those minutes. I move to approve the March 17th, 2023 policy board draft meeting minutes as presented. Second. Thank you. We have a motion from uh, Councillor Mendez and a second from Mr. Williams. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. Aye. For a brief moment there, I thought Williams or Williams' son. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next item on our agenda is the federal COVID funding. Commissioner Chang has asked that we move this back so that he can be here and participate. And I agree 100%. I, we would like to have the input from our other elected official. So we're going to move number, we're just gonna skip past agenda item number five for the moment and go ahead and move on to number six, which are federal performance member, mem measures. Woo! And Tyler will take us through that item. All right, this is, I told, Councilor Campbell, that this is the probably the least interesting topic on our agenda today. It's kind of wonky at times, so I will try and make it as interesting as possible. So uh, a little bit of background. Back in 2012, Congress, when they approved the Surface Transportation Bill at that time, which was known as MAP 21, they established performance measures uh, for MPOs and state DOTs carried forward under both the FAST Act and the current Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And they're striving to establish a performance and outcome-based transportation program for both state DOTs and MPOs. Uh, there are quite a few goals out there that were established under those different uh, legislative packages. And there are three that are applicable to us. The first and probably the biggest is safety. The second is infrastructure condition. And then the third is system reliability. You'll see on there, it says national highway system for those second two for infrastructure condition and reliability. If you look at the bottom bullet there, you can see what roadways within the Bend MPO are part of the national highway system. And so you have, of course, Highway 20 and Highway 97. But we also have some of our local arterial roads uh, parts of Reed Market Road, parts of 27th Street, and uh, Empire, parts of Empire Avenue are also part of that, as well as South, South 3rd Street. So the measures on safety that we need to track and monitor are 
number of fatalities, number of serious injuries, and then fatalities and sin- serious injury rates. So that's based on a per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. And then the number of fatalities and serious injuries for non-motorized users, bicyclists and pedestrians. And then infrastructure, they're pretty simple uh, for the uh, pavement condition. It's just the percentage of pavement on the national highway system that's in good condition or poor condition, same for bridges. And then travel time reliability is just looking at the percentage of miles traveled that are reliable. And I'll just, on the last one, travel time reliability, the way, it's kind of an odd measure, the way that the Federal Highway Administration makes this measure, they look at the reliability of the entire national highway system, all those segments as one. And if anybody recalls who was engaged in the city's TSP process a few years ago, we spent a fair amount of time talking about system reliability. And we, we talked about more of getting to a point of looking at individual corridors or areas in the city. Uh, and I think that's where the city will ultimately go is moving in that direction. And so, you know, my little editorial comment is that the national measure that we have is sort of useless in the sense that it doesn't really give us information that's can help us inform any of our decisions in any meaningful way. Doesn't give anybody any useful information, does it? Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> so as I said, it's kind of a quirky one, and I, you know, I'll I'll get to it in just a minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> next two slides. Just talk about these are just kind of we put in here. Andre wanted to add these. You know, thought, thought it would be good to show what's happening locally, and so this slide shows. Performance measures are identified in the city of Bend's transportation system plan, and you'll see that there's some overlap uh, between hours, uh, between the federal requirements as well as some that are in the city TSP. And some of these tie directly into some of the funding discussions that we've been having recently as well. And this slide shows the performance measures that are gonna be required of the city under the climate friendly and equitable communities require new rules and Again, I mean, there's some overlap within these with the existing city TSP performance measures. And so just kind of jumping back a little bit, uh, ODOT, they established their targets back in 2017, 2018. Um, and then they have to submit updated safety data to the Federal Highway Administration every year, and they have to submit updates on the other measures every two years. Um, and under this system, we have an option. We can either support ODOT's targets or we can generate our own. And at least to date, we have supported ODOT's targets because of, uh, I think really around just staffing issues and not being able to monitor and collect the data that we would need to have our own performance measures. And I think, and we've also said, once the city had this TSP done and started working on its own, that we would work to help support the city to monitor its own performance measures that they've identified. So this slide, ton of data on here, and I'll just kind of highlight a couple of things. This is showing ODOT and Bend and PO crash data. So the top two rows there where it says statewide data, that's a rolling average of number of crashes, number of fatalities, and so on, on across the entire state. And the bottom two rows are within the Bend MPO for that same, those two things. And Tyler, serious injury means transported <laughs> to the hospital. More than that, I think under the, I'll have, I'll have to put Joel on the spot. I have to. It's way life altering. Oh, really? Oh, There's okay. three classifications of injury crashes, and the you know, serious injuries are those that are life altering. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a subset of uh, injury. <laughs> is that correct, Joel? Yes. Uh, yeah. We, a, there's A, B, and C. You would, a, a is a serious injury. Yeah. It's in general, yes, you're a transporter, but then there's other, other stuff going on. Yeah. yeah. So following up with folks and seeing, how well they've recovered, it sounds like. Is well, that- I think the data is off the original crash report. So they are, there's, okay. a, there's a, tr- like, there's a limit to the, to the data, right? Okay. It's triaged at the scene. Okay. Um, although in a multi, like, so in a multi-vehicle crash, mm-hmm. right, there'll be at least three, often three reports. There'll be the police report you know, that they'll fill it out and then each individual in the crash will fill it out and that you self-select 
what your injuries are. And one of the reasons why it takes us or ODOT forever to get crash data is that somebody has to take those three reports and, and figure out how to code them into one thing. If some Eric Clint was out there. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Joel. So one thing I was going to point out, just a couple of notes on this slide. Um, you'll see on the far left that statewide crashes <laughs> you know, increased. That's been a trend that's been happening now for quite a few years. <laughs> the number of or the number of fatalities has been increasing. Um, you know, within the Bend area, it's held steady. And then if you look as you go across, you look at fatality rate. If you look at the statewide numbers versus our numbers, you can see that our, our rate is, is what I would consider to be significantly lower than statewide. And if you jump over two more columns to the serious injury rate, you'll again see that our serious injury rate is you know, much, much lower than the statewide numbers. And so we still do have a lot of crashes, but we are, you know, within the MPO area here, we're performing much better than uh, the state as a whole. Any questions on this slide? And I can, we have some other graphs that we can share in the future that are a little more interesting, I think, than this. You know. So that fifth column is uh, non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries. Is that the serious injury rate? No, it's just the average number over that five-year period. So what does the serious injury rate mean? The fourth column? That is, uh, that's all crashes that, go into a that are, lead to a serious injury, and it's based on per 100 million miles of vehicle mile. 100 million vehicle miles. Oh, instead of based on, I was going to guess. Yeah, data. it's based on travel, based huh. on vehicle huh. travel. Um, so I've noticed that I think, um, and and I think we've had some thoughts about this. Bend has a very high, surprisingly high rate of non-motorist uh, fatalities. Uh, if you look at it, like you know, the proportion of fatalities every year in Bend that is non-motorist yeah. is much higher than the state average. Bob, uh, can you? I think that's true. Put you on the spot. You know, so yeah, um, and and I think it's on your website. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the thing that I'm worried about is when we look at uh, like the safety performance measures, PM1, by these measures, uh, Highway 97 looks really great for walking and biking. <laughs> um, yeah. Because it, there's nobody that is, I mean, there's very few people that feel comfortable doing that and with right. good reason. Um, so I'm, I like a lot of these other metrics more, but the, the concern about the proportion, you know, people have this feeling of, well, is it really safe to go out? And if they say no, <laughs> instead, that doesn't really, it's not really reflected. Here. Right. Right. Uh, so any thoughts on, I mean, some of these other targets, I think, look really good that we can really focus on. Any thoughts on how to kind of try to capture the, yeah, nobody is riding or you know, crossing Highway 97 with good reason, yes, at least the PM1, but other metrics that we could use to try to capture that. Maybe counts. I mean, I feel like counts are something that we could probably benefit from. I know the city yes. has some of them. Uh, is that reliable? Um, maybe that's an area where we could focus. Yeah, I think a better counting program would be better. I mean, it would, would be useful. Um, and then I think getting a better understanding, and I don't know how you do this, would be through polling or something like that, is understanding what people are thinking. Yeah, because we've heard just anecdotally public meetings in the past that people's, at least their perception of biking and walking is getting worse. I mean, they, they feel they're feeling less and less safe. And so people are biking and walking less often, you know, because they don't feel safe within their, even within their own neighborhoods, let alone, you know, traveling along some of our major roadways. Mm -hmm. So how we get to that and really start to understand that it's kind of it will be a challenge, I think, but there's a lot of work happening around the country on that very issue. And Joel. So um, if I could just inter interject this, I think these measures are really helpful and how you use them is like, all right, how do I compare myself to other MPOs and what does that look like? 
Um, but they're not necessarily the measures you want to do use to manage and operate your system. Yeah. Right. Like, I, so I think some of the stuff that, that you're getting at is like, well, how do I know, how do I know how to make my system better? However you define that these, these are probably not the measures like rate based fatalities and crash data is a good way to compare yourself to peers, but you don't, you want to not kill people. Right. Yeah. So you want to make that number zero. You don't care about the rate, right? Because your rate could go down because many more people drive, right? The rate is zero and it looks like there's nobody dying either. Right. But like Germany has, a, it looks like Germany is way more dangerous than Georgia for people biking. But that's because there's nobody biking in Georgia or Florida, right. but lots of people are biking in Germany. Right. So Again, this, yeah, how do you compare versus how do you evaluate yourself and operate operate your operate your system? And sometimes there's different different measures. Thank so, you. Good right. question, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, any any uh, yeah, keep it in the mind. Yeah. Any <laughs> thoughts about whether I mean not, I think better counting is probably one way to go, but and some of these other mobility targets, I think, seem, seem really good, too. I'll talk to Robin, you know, kind of offline about this and see. Well, and maybe where the city's at with their, the TSP measures, the couple slides that we had before that, that I think may hit on some of the things you're talking about. All right, so you thought there was a lot of data on this one. <laughs> so, um, and I'll just, this is the infrastructure and reliability. <laughs> what I note on here is that uh, you know, if you look kind of from left to right on some of these measures, on a few of these things, at least in terms of payments, ODOT is assuming a reduction in the percentage of payments that are in poor condition. You know, I think they're starting is they're starting to they are looking out at their revenues revenue forecast. They're assuming that they're gonna have less money to do high, you know, highway preservation and maintenance. And so the percentage of payments that are in poor condition is going to start increasing over time. And then you'll see um, same on the, the bridge data. They're showing it's a very slow up, uptick, but it's a big deal just in the sense that ODOT has a very large bridge system, number of bridges on their system. And you know. They are already significantly behind in terms of being able to maintain what they have. And so as that decreases, that's just going to make the situation only get worse. And then the last call or the last row is percentage of miles that are reliable. You know, it's the measure I said it's not very good. We're killing it. We're 95% reliable according to the data we get from what does ODOS. reliable mean? <laughs> um, it will be a, a road tomorrow. It is a road today and it will be tomorrow also. <laughs> That's really it takes you the same amount of time. Yes, yeah, it's the it's amount of time to, to work yeah. every yeah. single day. It's a, it's, a, it's a measure of variation in travel time. Yeah, yeah. it's time reliability, of course. <laughs> and so that one I said, you know, it's looking collectively at all of those roadways that are on the national highway system. And so it's a little bit, it's like, okay, it looks great, but I don't know that it really provides us any useful information is your planning and programming. And so things that we have to do, I mean, as part of our long range plan, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, we keep track of those performance measures and we show our progress or lack of progress towards achieving those targets. In our short range program, which is our, you know, our capital improvement program, you know, we also try to describe as best we can how we are meeting these measures as well. And then we work with ODOT annually to our safety data. Um, so our, we're recommending that you know, the MPO board support the adopted ODOT safety pavement bridge and reliability goals. Um, but we've listed some things too that we think you know, we should be pursuing as, a, as an entity. It was encouraging all of our elected bodies or appointed bodies to continue directing funding towards projects and programs that help us meet those meet and exceed those targets. Um, direct MPO to staff to help support the data development and monitoring of the city's TSP and CFEC 
monitoring our purpose that they'll have. And then something new that I added on here was we think we have an opportunity or a couple of different opportunities to seek funding to update our safety transportation safety action plan. And a lot of interest in doing that. The plan that we put together you know, five years ago, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. And so we were, you know, we had a lot of discussion on how best to do that. And the primary projects are identified in that plan. Most of them have been either there's been a project at those locations or they're in the city site for improvement. And there's a few on the ODOT system, same thing. They, there's also money available in the ODOT house program. And since we want to look, I get a new list of projects so that we can then go after grant funding to particularly on the safety side of things. So any questions on this item? Um, the only other, um, maybe as a next step, COACT has a safety committee. Yeah. Um, just we want to continue to be involved in that, cooperate, whatever, any support, help. Is, is there an opportunity here? I mean, I'm just looking at the Oregon and Bend MPO crash data page, and it's a little bit hard because some of the columns get combined, the different categories, like we have the non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries are combined as one metric. Um, but I would be interested in really shining a light on, I mean, even in this table, you can see there's a, the rate, the ratio of, of, uh, non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries column compared to average total fatalities per year. Yeah. Much higher for than MPO than Oregon statewide. Like that number is much closer to the average fatalities per year, but I think we'd have to do a little bit more work to actually make sure that we're comparing yeah, apples to apples here. Yes, but I feel like that's that's a pretty important metric to uh, to track. Yeah, um, is there any opportunity to to shine a light on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Robin, with some of the data we get, I mean, we were able to kind of parse. We were able to parse out fatalities versus serious injuries. Uh, I believe with the data that we receive, and we can we can come back. With more I mean, we still run into the same problem that, you know, if, if very few people are out walking and biking, then very few of them are likely to get injured or killed. But um, from what I can tell, it seems like those rates are, are much higher locally than they are compared to the rest of the state. And that yeah. would be, a, I think, an important yeah. thing to, to take a look at. Well, Tyler, what about when we update our TSOP, our Transportation Safety Action Plan? Yeah, I mean, we could we could definitely call that out and put more up, more focus on you know the biking biking walking crashes and try and parse out see truly dig in and see what's happening. It sounds like that's what you're asking for today is just is something different. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think for purposes of being able to keep us keep everything moving, you know, just supporting what ODOT's proposing right now is, is good, but I think we want to come back and work with the city and others to make sure that we have performance measures that we that truly make sense for us locally and that we can then use those to help influence how funding decisions are made. Yeah, I mean, that's my only concern is it, from what I can tell, it looks like the ODOT safety um, metrics are missing kind of a concern about the ratio of non-motorists being injured and killed and and the total number, which I think is also important. Uh, but uh, I want to be want to be clear about what these figures are being used for. If they're not used for our planning purposes, then I would find adopting them. I just feel like they're missing some of the story. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, what's your timing uh, to have these in place to meet the federal requirements? It's fine, right? Now, I mean, we need to take action soon to do either endorse or generate our own. And I think, you know, like I said, based on discussion we've had today and in the past, we are much more in support of not messing with the, the federal stuff too much, but actually having 
working with the city to adopt or implement, you know, adopt and implement local measures that can be, that we can really use for helping influence funding decisions. So there's a fair to say this is kind of the bare minimum that you need to, to be federally compliant. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's not saying we can't go above and beyond and locally correct. to dig in deeper, figure out those metrics, figure out how they can guide our choices. Um, the rest of the TSAP or, or, or another uh, measure or, yes. or be, be back in front of this board uh, again with here's what we want to do locally. Uh, yeah, that would be on this. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tim. So we're I'm looking for a motion here that is in our packet, if anyone would like to make that motion. Uh, I move to support the adopted ODOT safety pavement bridge and system performance measure targets by way of resolution 2023-01. I second. <laughs> it's kind of boring with the three person. Yeah, <laughs> Are we missing someone? Thank you. We have a motion from Councillor Mendez and a second from Mr. Williams. All those in favor? I Hi. Hi. thank you very much, Mr. Doty. That is unanimous. Great. And then Tyler, how about if we go ahead and look at number seven now? Does that sound right? Or do we want to go ahead and move to number eight and we could let Commissioner Chang um, input on the lecture series. Sure. Okay, so we're moving along to uh, agenda item number eight. Go ahead, Tyler. Just uh, get to my notes. So this this part, of, so we're going to talk a little bit about the federal carbon reduction program. I have a whole bunch of slides in here that I will jump through pretty quickly so we can get into kind of talking about some of the ideas that have been generated uh, for the Bend area. This is a new program when, under the IIJA. This is one of many, many new funding programs were created through that Infrastructure Act. It's going to provide funding for projects that re reduce transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the funding for this program in Oregon down uh, about a third of it will go to ODOT, a third will go to the three large MPOs, and a the third will go to everyone else. So the small MPOs. <laughs> non-MPO cities and counties. Cool. Then MPO area is guaranteed to receive about 1.1 million total in five years of the bill. Uh, these are, again, these are, it's a federal, federal project and these will require a local match of about 10%. The program identifies as big project categories. There's vehicle and fuel technology projects, transportation options projects, systems operations projects, as well as pricing that are all eligible for these funds. Any questions so far? Uh, administration of these funds, These again, these are federal funds, so uh, ODOT presumably will be delivering any of these projects that are awarded within the Bend area. And if the city of Bend becomes federally certified, awards in the outer years could potentially be delivered by the city. Um, ODOT is administering this application process and the current application window, the window is already open. So it started February 28th and extends through the end of May. There will be a second application process about a year from now. And while ODOT doesn't have a project minimum uh, funding request, you know, our direction Based on discussion we had with ODA, we would suggest you know at least hundred thousand, if not more, just given the difficulty of programming, processing federal funds. Um, the thing I'll highlight on this slide: the evaluation criteria for projects or applications are submitted list on the bottom, so you can see the climate benefits are the bulk of how the projects will be evaluated. There's some other categories in there in terms of support, equity, innovation, as well as product project readiness. Um, this application process is open to all the anybody who's eligible to receive federal funding within the MPO areas. So you can see that it's it's more than 
just <coughs> Citibank and you know, a couple of others. There's quite a, you know, quite a few entities that could apply for these funds. Um, and we, at staff level, we had a goal of wanting to, uh, you know, we've pulled together our technical advisory committee and invited a few other folks into that process. And our, real, our goal was we wanted to minimize agencies locally competing against each other, uh, given that it's, yeah, one, $1 million is great, but it's not a lot of money in the bigger scheme of things when you try to you know, figure out how to program that much money. And you know, we wanted to try and reach consensus on those priority projects. Um, I mentioned we met twice with our technical an expanded TAC and tried to work through a prop, tried to work through that process. And you can see that we didn't make what I would consider to be great progress on you know coming to consensus, but I think we did narrow our you know, list of, of potential projects. And so on this slide, you know, things that were identified at our last meeting, uh, our last technical advisory committee meeting, CET is interested in you know seeking additional funding to build upon this COVID funds so that were awarded by the MPO so they can fully install shelters at all of their high, high priority stop locations. Commute options would like you know, $50,000 per year for the five years of the, of the bill to expand their travel options outreach programs, including outreach to large employers are gonna be impacted by the state's new employee commute option program. Uh, City of Bend, in just a moment, we'll be sharing uh, some slides, I believe, talking about their project proposals. And then back when I talked about funding, about a third of the funding goes to ODOT. I believe this, I believe ODOT has reached out to the city to talk about some potential partner partnership opportunities to use some of their funding on projects on, I think on Highway 20 through Bend. All righty. Um, so is the idea with, given that there's so many other agencies that are eligible, is, I mean, is the idea to try to identify projects that have support of different agencies and I, you know, try to find a way to prioritize them and then coordinate an effort so that we're not competing, we don't see competition or? Yeah, I mean, I think when we first met, the idea was when we had everybody in the room, we just wanted to, you know, say as a school district, were they interested in applying? Were, you know, were other folks interested? And we didn't get, you know, the only three that we really heard about, so Cascade these transit commute options in the city. The other folks didn't, have expressed interest in trying to pursue these funds at least at this point in time. So did we generate a, I mean, is this the list that we basically heard from and said, all right, give us your ideas and then let's let's start talking about it or? Yeah, I mean, we initially, the first meeting we generated a pretty long list. We probably had 15 different project ideas. But they were ideas. Yeah, it was mostly, it was just kind of a, you know. Brainstorming. Brainstorming session. Yeah. Then we had, we asked, we, as we looked at that list, you know, the city of Ben was responsible for 10 of those ideas and so on. And we said, hey, come back with more detail at the next meeting. And when they did that, uh, city, most of the projects the city had at least initially identified, they didn't uh, want to pursue them further at this point in time. And so they've narrowed it down to just a couple of ideas. I would, I mean, I think it sounds like it'll I'd love to hear more about some of the other ideas. One idea that just to, from our earlier conversation, I have heard that it's counting is hard. Uh, and if there's a, if there's an opportunity to get that kind of data and can be shared, uh, can be, you know, I see other cities with video counters and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff that seems like there might be an opportunity to improve the data that we have locally. So that might be one, but I, I have an open mind and I would love to hear what some of the other agencies ideas are too. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask is uh, EV charging infrastructure. Is that ineligible? It is. Yes. Project? Uh, I'll jump back to that fits under that first, that top category of vehicle and fuel technology. And I think in, in the initial discussion, we had uh, staff there that you're fairly familiar with the structure. And I think the feedback that we got at that first meeting was that there are numerous grant opportunities out there at the state and federal level for EV infrastructure. And so they felt it best not to, given that we have this, yeah. given there's other opportunities, not to, not to pursue these dollars for that type of project. Do you want me to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So there's a new program coming out from ODOT actually, 
which is a rebate program that qualifies up to $150,000, which is more prescribed program where up to 75% of expenses are eligible eligible for like a rebate. That's a flat fee up to $42.50 for a public agency per port. So if it's a dual port charger, that's almost $8,000. There's federal funding too. I think we, the city didn't want to feel we can pursue the federal funding for EV charging because the minimum project amount is $500,000. But I had a great conversation actually this morning with some county um, team members about there, like the county, the courthouse expansion, the parking asset development in the future, there might actually be some synergy where like maybe the public agencies could come together and saying, like, here's the parks, here's the city, here's the county. Together, we, if we identify some locations, we could pursue an application that is probably $500,000 or more for EV charging. Um, I think that's why we felt this funding being so limited, especially over five years, um, we didn't want to go in high item um, projects because it just gets eaten up so quick. Thank you. So I think, do we have, does anybody from the city have slides or information there? We have slides. Can we have, have slides? A few. Stop sharing. Um, let me see. Do I need to log on to the meeting to do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike. Um, just bear with me. This awkward silence, I don't mean to, but my battery is very low, so I'm shutting this up. I can do it if you want. Can you do it? I just say too, I mean, one of the things that we, there were quite a few of us at the table with ODOT when they were putting together the application process and getting everything organized. And I said, the odd thing is we're guaranteed to receive, you know, about a little over a million dollars here, but ODOT's running the whole process. And we had, the MPOs, we all made the pitch of saying, hey, if we're guaranteed the money, why, why don't we run it? Just like we'd run our STBG funding process. And we didn't, we didn't get that support, you know, and so that's why we kind of that's why we pulled together the technical committee is we didn't want to have three million dollars worth of applications coming in from our area, you know, for for you know relatively small bottom line. Tyler, while they're pulling it up, I have a question. So, yeah, my agency is the the climate office is the one that's going to be basically scoring these applications when they come in. So even though you have a guaranteed million dollars, could you submit applications that score so poorly that they don't get awarded, even though you have the million dollars? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think we could, you know, we could think we have a million dollars of great projects and then a, the scoring committee could come back and say, we're only going to give you 300 for right now, which then force us into, we would have to come up with a plan on submitting an application or applications in the next round. Of right. Because it, 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 there is multiple rounds. At least two. At least right. two. Okay. So maybe when we're done hearing the different presentations, we can go back and look at the scoring criteria. Yeah. Hey, Tyler, can you make Robin a, I'm oh. able to bump her up as panelist so that she can share her screen. Pop in just a second, Robin. I have the mycelia connection, but the invite disappeared. There you go. So Robin is share. You're sharing, Robin, right? I will share. So I think I can start talking about this a little bit. So we we went. Right? Am I? Yes. Okay. So we went through this eva evolution of talking about a lot of different projects, like Andrea mentioned. There were a lot of ideas, but a lot of them were larger projects that we felt once you start going with them, they're not feasible projects. And so we really wanted to focus on. What is something that can give us the biggest carbon reduction and climate benefit that we can get? And so we can, um, we, we looked at the eligibility criteria and the reduction strategy from ODOT for all carbon reduction strategy for ODOT really talks about, like Tyler said, transportation options, system operations, vehicle and fuel technologies. And we felt that we wanted to look for something that really helps us 
for the first time having the opportunity to truly initiate a mode shift for transportation and to and focus also on disadvantaged areas and, and community groups that can benefit from that and to overall improve our transportation system and efficiency. And so we zeroed in a little bit. You can go to the next yeah. We zeroed in a little bit as like the theme of the of the application to initiate transportation mode shift through infrastructure developments and new transportation options. One important factor is that the money that commute options would hope to receive out of that, commute options can apply for this directly, I believe. So it would have to be in partnership with the city. And we have spent a lot of time with Brian and commute options to really see what can we do together to really have a comprehensive, great partnership application. And so as part of infrastructure, we really, we had more and more conversations over the last couple of weeks with some of the housing developments that are happening in the city of Bend. And so we really felt there's some alignment with the transportation system plan. You all, most of you are familiar with the TSP and with the call for mobility hubs in four quadrants of the city and the core. And we felt there might be some synergy when we looked at the new affordable housing developments that are happening actually in the east, in the south, in the west, and in the north, and potentially in the core to align that with mobility projects, not full-blown mobility hubs yet, but the smaller versions, mobility points. Um, some of them are actually, you have talked about them in, in other meetings, like the um, core community and housing works um, project on Simpson. There's still water crossing in the south. There's Park Place um, of Highway 20. There's a new one in the north that's planned. So there's quite a few. And our affordable housing director was very excited to reach out to the developers and said, if there's an opportunity for us to partner on this, would you be willing? And so far we have only received yes. That would be great to make those uh, that access available to our community, our new community communities. That said, under infrastructure, we really hope that through this funding, we could build a plan where we have some shovel ready, smaller mobility points that we can initiate in 2023. Then when these housing projects are coming up, we could like housing works, com core community trust project on Simpson would potentially come online or start construct construction in 2024. So we would partner with them to do something there. Park Place or others that are coming in 2025, we would partner with them there. So we're really not trying to blow all the money in year one, but really stretch it out over time. But it was really important that we feel like from our perspective, city staff, that we start pairing infrastructure with services. Because us just building a mobility point or like new like bike racks doesn't do anything for the people living there. And so over the last couple of days, we have spent a lot of time talking, what if we could actually use this funding to actually invest in like, sure, create the infrastructure, right? Mobility points to make sure that's there. Use the existing e-bike share program that we're continuing with BIRD to be present in these locations, but then invest in something like e-cargo bikes that would, when we build a mobility point in an affordable housing community, we actually purchase e-cargo bikes, station them there, make them available to the people live there and the general public if they want them. So Housing Works Corp Community Trust, the Simpson Project, it's called the Simpson Project, easier, it's too long for a word for me, is a great example. It's very close to Century Drive, the safe way there. And so we could actually really have an impact on reducing carbon emissions and VMTs by if we have e-cargo bikes there that are available to the population that live there that they can use to actually go to do their grocery shopping. And then we thought a second element of that would also be, and we already have a great example, with a core community trust project on the east side of 27, where they actually have an EV, that's a car share program in partnership with Fourth Mobility. What if we actually purchase passenger and pickup trucks, EVs, that we can also station in these locations. Granted, it will not get anybody out of a car, but it will enable people to share a car, to reduce VMTs, be more sustainable, and commute options. And Brian has given me card blanche, and I think he's online too, but he has given me card blanche to mention their name. Um, and he's 
available online for questions in case you don't believe me, to say Commute Options is a willing partner in operating and running these programs with us. Um, and another element would be obviously we had a lot of conversations with CET, with Eric, with Andrea, that these mobility um, points that we're building need to have a transit connection. So we want to nurture that as um, CET is starting to come online with more services now that they're hiring more. We want to make sure we're connecting that. As CET, I believe it's fair to say, is now applying for grant funding for microtransit vehicles. We don't know how they will be operated. These locations can be the operations. There's a lot of synergy happening right now. And then we would definitely make funding available out of the overall pitch to support commute options with TDM incentives and ridership incentives so that we can actually balance this and create a sustainable program that doesn't only live during the time while we have funding available, but actually we're looking at more, this is seed money to start these new services that then can be sustaining themselves by being market rate on the left and subsidize incentivize services for people that need it on the, on, on the right, so to speak, for, for the purpose of this meeting. Um, we are, if you go to the next page real quick, um, there are, this is a high level map to kind of like put in perspective in this um, of what we've talked about. These are active projects that we know are either by shovel ready. So the city is looking at, there's a mobility hub, mobility point that CET is constructing at the Troy Field lot in downtown Bend. We are looking at two locations uh, in the heart of Old Bend actually, near the Bend Central District on Northwest Hill Street, potentially other locations, Brenda Square. I just said, I'm gonna say this very careful, but there was an early conversation with the, the county team today that has some interest in doing more mobility services and when there's the courthouse expansion is happening. So that we really can build this like 23, 24, 25 progressive road. And we are, um, so we would really follow the TSP outline here. Um, and that would be great because I think it has been a challenge for the city over the last years to get at the table with some of these new developments before they happen. And then we find ourselves having to react to it where this is a great opportunity to actually shift to do things differently from the beginning. Um, we feel that this is very measurable, that through not only the infrastructure, but the services that come with it, through the e-cargo bikes and potential EVs, that we can actually really give a good solid application to achieve the 60 points for climate reduction, because we can actually measure, if we get X amount of rights, we will save this many um, metric tons of CO2 and reduce this many B BMTs. But bigger than that, I think it can also function as a model for how future developments can shift from the conception in the future. So that's my pitch. Robin, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, and I think the, the commute options role in this is critical as well, just to also do um, training and, and build confidence in new riders um, and new transit systems. Like they've already got that experience of um, transit training and where do these routes go and how do you use them? And the same with the bikes and the e-bikes and they know um, how to get riders feeling confident and, um, you know, knowing the network. The city is also working on this, um, you know, wayfinding system and, and maps and just sharing all of this so that people are more confident in where they can get to um, and then giving them the vehicles to do that. Yeah, and on the e cargo bikes, I would like just, this is funny because our Ariel mentioning like Germany and Georgia, and I know you were So, but it's funny because I grew up in this small town in Germany that when I was, when I was a teenager, we had 2000 or 3000 people living there, right? And that small, tiny town, which is still a small, tiny town with now 4,500 people living there, has two e cargo bikes. <laughs> that are available for people to use and rent whenever they want. They did that strategically so that, hey, you know what, if you want to walk or take a bike to go to the grocery store, just jump on the bike. And it helped that small town to eliminate like car trips. And I think that's awesome. It's a great example. And it also shows that this actually, it took us a little bit to get there in our evolution of things. But I think this is something tangible that can actually make a real difference and set an example for for the future. Brian, would you like to jump in on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for all your comments. Uh, thank you, Robin, also for your comments about our ability to, uh, you know, educate our community. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Brian Potwin. I'm the Community Options Executive Director. So I wanted to expand on the TD and incentives portion of it. So we are, we've met with the city a bunch to talk about what's going to be the best project for this proposal for this grant. So we're proposing to combine efforts with the city to use the get there platform for TDM incentives within the carbon reduction strategy. So just a little information about get there if you don't know. Uh, it's an easy to use online trip planning tool where users can compare commute options, find carpool matches, learn and engage with local resources such as this project that we're talking about right now, earn incentives for choosing TO. And I think the most important piece alongside of all that is tracking the stats and getting the data. Uh, for reduction in carbon emissions, calories burned, which is great, but also reduced BMT. Uh, so Get There is currently being administered by us and is ready right now to expand uh, and meets the needs uh, and the criteria of this project. Uh, so using Get There will add the ability to collect the TO and carbon reduction data that we're all talking about that's so needed. Uh, as well as increase access, which is a huge part of our mission to increase access to TO for low income residents and disadvantaged residents in our community. And that combines also with everything Robin was saying as far as the education and the access to knowing how to use these resources. So uh, thank you for allowing us to partner with you all. Thank you, Brian. Robin, do you have other slides? No, we were. <laughs> our, our understanding was that um, from our understanding from conversation with the MPO is really that this is an application that has to go through ODA and that we're looking that everybody was pitching, whether that's like CET for more transit shelters, our pitch, that we're looking really for the endorsement from the MPO. And honestly, I feel that it, all the projects that are brought forward, whether that's the CT project or ours or others, I think have a benefit to the city. So I would probably assume and that this the MPO would endorse almost every project because they're good for the overall. One thing on what you like leading up to this, what, what you mentioned earlier about like the measuring, um, we have learned a lot from this, our application last year for the federal smart grant application. Um, and I reviewed all the projects that were funded and I think there's a huge opportunity to do something that is more like using counting cameras and curb management measurements to, to be funded through the smart grid application in the next round. And that's a $2 million application for a phase one that can be scaled in a stage two up to $60 million. So I think there's a huge opportunity for something like that, just to deter you a little bit from this one. And just to clarify, um, any of those agencies can apply. Yes. They don't need the MPO. We have just been trying to convene, coordinate, get everybody together, try and reduce um, competing grants from right. our MPO. Yeah, and we think ODOT hasn't given us word, official word, but we think that they're going to want MPO board endorsement of any applications okay. that come out of it. You know, each of the area. So sure. that was that was kind of our goal too, was to get to a point that you know as close as possible to that million dollar figure. And then are the projects that are being potentially being submitted? Are there projects that are being endorsed? And the MPO could apply for the money ourselves. We could compete with the city of Bend for the money. Is yes, that true? Technically, yes. Uh, interesting. No, I'm not suggesting that. Just, you know, <laughs> making sure I understand. Exactly. <laughs> hmm, where are we going with this? No, okay, that's very interesting. And what I understand is the cargo bike, it, what's specifically today being discussed is not just adding cargo bike or bikes to the bike rental program that we already have. It's specific to a development um, a housing project, for example. Yeah, a micro hub. Mike, oh, so it would be with the micro hub. So who would own the bike? 
Ah, excellent question. Yeah, it is. So the goal would be that we would partner. <laughs> sorry, can I? You yeah. Want to jump? Yeah. yeah. So I think our first train of thought, and we, I will be upfront. We wanted to keep this very high level for this meeting because uh -huh. the application is deep. Sure. So yes. and that would be taking up an entire meeting to just run through that. Sure. Our initial thoughts regarding the cargo bikes is to work with. Um, to do it like actually very similar to how the Zexter bike shop program worked. Uh -huh. So we would work with local bike shops to procure and purchase the bikes, bicycles through the funds and then partner with them for maintenance, ongoing maintenance what? and operation for the program. Uh -huh. So that, And then being very strategic about how we're managing that. And then we can say, um, yeah, we want to do these mobility points um, as they come and get them electrified or like ready for electrification so that we can then combine that with different funding like the OBED rebate program. But on the other hand, once we bring these housing developments up and we have three pretty much, I think it's fair to say, got, a, got, got the confirmation, fair to say three yeses from affordable housing developers that are saying, yes, we want to work with you. We would be delighted if those services would be available to our residents. So I think we are, we, that's great to know, so. Thank you. And same question regarding an electric vehicle car. Mm -hmm. Who would own that? How would, you know, who's gonna? Yep. Yeah. Great question. So I think we would use the funding to purchase them and we have checked with ODOT that that is an eligible expense. So we talked with Rai, who is at the climate office and oversees this program, that the purchase of equipment and vehicles is an eligible expense. Um, under that, there's some Buy American guidelines that I think need to come because there's federal money behind that. So high level, I would assume it could be something like this. We would, City of Bend would purchase the vehicles through the grant funding that's available. We would then work on the operating agreements, either way with commute options or fourth mobility, who is actually up half. Go forth is their car share program that they're operating. And you can operate that with your own vehicle. We could, in our mind, Again, details to be worked out. In our mind, it could work very similar how we have approached the houseless programs that we did, where we have a grant agreement with an operator or a nonprofit organization where we grant, where we could extend these vehicles to them. It is not our interest, I mean, upfront, not our interest to operate this ourselves. Right. We are, we are, <laughs> it is not. That's where we are reaching out to our partners uh -huh. that know what they're doing uh -huh. um, and can do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so right now, we're, um, do we need any kind of action at all right now, Tyler? She provides a back direction to staff. Yeah, I guess my, this, my question would be is, there's two proposals on the table. CET, you know, wanting funding for shelters. I don't know if Eric wants to share anything, you know. Yeah, no, we're excited to kickstart this program uh, with the COVID relief funds that we received at a previous NPO policy board meeting. Um, I placed our first order for Hawthorne Station rebuild uh, just last week. So uh, that's separate from the, that round of grant funding, but we're, we're starting to work with our new vendor and we'll soon have these shelters in Central Oregon. Um, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with Central, uh, the Hawthorne Station is going to be undergoing construction, uh, reconfiguring the lot, bring in buses onto our property, and we'll be uh, putting these same style shelters out there. Um, but now that we're finally moving with that vendor, we're going to move forward with uh, a bunch of uh, shelters thanks to that funding. And we want to expand that even further mm -hmm. and have a community input process along with this where we can, you know, we have high priority locations, we have a short list but there's plenty of other stops that can be involved as well. And we want to involve you know, community feedback to see what is your priority location for these stops. Um, so the more shelters that we can afford to replace and, and build out, the more we can engage community in that way uh, and meet their needs. So we're excited. Yeah, so the, my only question is, I mean, is the board Feel like you have enough information to endorse the proposals that are out there today, or are there other things you want us to come back next month with any additional information? I mean, I, I really like the 
I, I like, well, I get the logic of the, the greater benefit to more shelters. Uh, you know, it's maybe hard to measure like what, I think we authorize up to like something like 15 shelters, but yeah. I understand, you know, could do 25. Uh, there would be some additional benefit to that. I really like the program that uh, Toby and Robin described. I've experienced the per personally the benefits of visiting other cities and having access to something like a cargo bike or, or bike share. I think it's great, uh, though it does raise a question which I, you don't have to answer right now, but if visitors have access to them, it, I think it's great. It's great for BMT reduction. People get around without driving and things of that nature, but it does undermine the benefits to the residents. And if that happens, maybe that means we need more of them. You know? And so maybe we wait and see, I don't know. But just a thought about, you know, if, if suddenly people think, oh, I can rent an electric vehicle or I don't have to, you know, I can just use this uh, electric cargo bike, um, then it means it might not be available to, to residents that were, I think, in initially described as benefiting from this program, but I think it sounds great. I think that's a really great point. And I think I wanted to stress that, that I think when we relaunch bike share, yes, bike share is accessible. We have reduced cost price for um, people, like people groups that need that. But it is fair to say that our top priority was not to create the program to serve marginalized or disadvantaged people groups. And I think if you would say anything else, that wouldn't be truthful. With this program, it's the other way around. So yes, if we need it and can expand it to make it available to visitors, we'll do that. But the focus really is to focus on the people groups in that live in these developments to like create that mode shift, create that opportunity and provide that access to new transportation options. I'd like to ask both groups a question, and this is not in any way putting a judgment one way or the other on the application process. But I mentioned to Tyler earlier about the scoring criteria. Okay. And I, the scoring criteria. Oh yeah. And, I, and I'm not sure, because it says 60% is carbon reduction. And I, do, I don't know how the climate office is gonna evaluate that. But I think in both of these, at least to me, it sounds like we have ideas that may reduce this if they get used. So give us the money and five years from now, we'll be able to tell you if it actually worked. And I don't know how that's gonna score because it's got, it's, I don't know how they're scoring 60% yeah. of it for carbon reduction. Mm -hmm. So like you make transit more attractive or we provide a service, but that's not the same as saying the service is gonna be used and we won't know how much carbon reduction we get until we can count the trips. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know how you, again, I don't know how they're scoring that, yeah. but that's my only caution is that, that was explicitly mentioned in the application packet, I believe that um, conceptual reductions or however they phrase okay. it, may be scored less preferentially yeah. than things that will happen. Yeah, because what I'm hinting at is if we're gonna enforce yeah. this and move forward, you know, I'm sure you're working really hard to make it the most successful application that you can, mm -hmm. But I think that's that one spot in there where it just it's a little nebulous and I don't know how it's going to turn out. Yeah, and I think that's a really valid point. And I think the but equally the truth is every most programs that like we are that any that most people will bring forward that references carbon reductions are all based on if hypotheses on change behavior, right? Like that's that's just the nature currently, right? Like we talked with Cassie Lacey, who's on our internal um, project team for this. And she felt this is actually the one that can clearly measure it because we can say we, we, will, we expect this many trips on a bike, this many trips in a car, and we can give a hard number from that. Is this still a hypothesis that, yeah, the number will be different if you get half the trips? True, but the number will also be different if you get twice, twice as many. The same is with the shelters. It's, we all know that we have talked about that. We know it's a stretch, Eric will agree with that, to say like shelters in itself will reduce carbon reductions. However, it's the, the chance and the theory that having, which I think we all believe in, I do, because I have kids and I'm like, I don't surely don't want to have my kids sitting on a bucket next to a, to a, um, a bus stop. 
But if it feels safe, I feel more that I'm going to use transit, right? So that's where the, that's it's a stretch, but we also need to be willing to go there. So I think your point is valid taken. Yeah, yeah. And we can the, the option to maybe check in with the staff to see. I mean, like, you know, we have data on bike share. And, and, and before we get too far, I can yeah. just to ease folks' minds, um, <laughs> it does explicitly call out uh, transit. Um, infrastructure. infrastructure. Yeah. And um, I've heard that on the and IT yeah, embedded exactly. in transit infrastructure. Yeah, and then on the small urban side, um, ODOT is separately pursuing, uh, I think, solar lighting for transit stops. So that kind of gives the proof of concept that that these kind of things, I think, should be acceptable. Uh, yeah. Now, whether it will outrun a better proposal. Uh, that's, well, that's always a question. The nice thing, the proposals are within this table, th th this area. Because uh, you know, if somebody came in and said, like, yeah, we're going to switch our diesel buses to EVs, they're going to score really well. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're just kind of in that. But again, we're only in competition with ourselves. Yeah. I just unfortunately don't know how they're running it um, you know, at the climate office. So that's yeah. And we reached out to Rye at the climate office to us. We reached out to um, David Emmerton first with some questions from Sarah Hudson, our senior analyst downtown. And then we, we, I reached out directly to Rai asking a couple of questions because at one time, just for the transparency, we thought, is this something that we can apply for, for right band to re, like revamp the channel service, right? And we, they, the response back was, yes, you can purchase those vehicles. We're not sure about the operation. So, so and, but if you want to apply, we'll find out. We asked the question, didn't get a response. Then we found out CD is applying for separate funding. And with all these different funding pockets right now, we don't want to duplicate the effort, right? We don't want to go for something here that we can do over here because I think we need to leverage this smarter. So, but it, yeah. To your point, Rick, though, in, in trying to bolster the application, yeah, maybe we can lean on some of the data we have, you know, as, as much as possible, right? The, the bike share relaunch has been extremely successful. Okay, can we take that data? So, yes, yeah, some of it's tourism based on where those bike racks are at, but some of it is like daily commuter users saying, yeah. you know, so instead of it just being, you know, build, build it and we hope they come, like, show, show what do we, we have got. some yeah. data that what we yeah. do have is if you put them, and then on top of that, where we're talking about these is getting in, I like the idea of getting in early on those development discussions so that there is that, that space and that avenue and that service for those folks in that area, other than rather than or opposed to it's built. And now we're trying to figure out how to come back in and, and fit out the, the deal. In and, and, yeah. Um, so I think the bike share and, and maybe there's some other data too that we can try to you know pull either, either transit or. I actually have a question that might lend to synergistic uh, element here is uh, are we envisioning these mobility points would be city owned easement that we can then go add a, a bus stop to later perhaps i think that depends on each location so i think i don't want to talk too much for like um what that would look like with the developers i think but robin maybe or janet i saw janet on that too but i think that each one what i can say i think fairly and honestly is that with every conversation we had there was like interest of yeah, that would be great. And we can give you some land over there. How that looks contractual, I I wouldn't want to speak for that yet. But I think where it's city already, city-owned land, that definitely something we can do. If CET, and I think if CET is willing like to make some adjustments in like where we're going with it, for sure. Thank you. So if I hear correctly, we are discussing two separate applications. For this grant money, one would come from City of Bend and Commute Options are working together on that application. And then CET is also interested in putting in an application. The applications are scored with 60 out of 100 points for that climate reduction. That's where Rick is advising everyone to make sure you pay attention to that on your application and you know as close as you can get to real numbers of carbon reduction 
that's what we anticipate is going to score the highest. The question for this board is, do we want to support um, and then specifically um, submit a letter of our support for either or both of these? Am I right? Correct. Woo! What can we go? <laughs> um, <laughs> and now this grant program, the applications have to be in next month. May. May 30th. Yeah. The end of May. <laughs> so we have one more meeting before those applications go in. Um, we would have, if we said in that next meeting is when we're finalizing our own decision about that, um, we would have just enough time if Tyler came to that meeting prepared with what a letter of support would look yes. like. Yes. Is that right? No? I'm just puzzled because I thought on the last slide there was actually four projects and you just said two. Great question. Oh, the, the commute options is not eligible on their own, so they would be within our application. So that merges it. Into the okay city's application. And then, four projects bundled into two applications. Well, yeah, and ODOT would be a standalone process. Yeah, with their own separate funding. But they're not seeking a, a, an MPO. Uh, no, no, no. no. They, no. they are in a separate track. Okay. Thank you, Phil. That's a great okay. question. Here are three projects that have been bundled into two CET and then commute options with city event. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, excuse me, Chair. Is there, a, yeah. is there a total dollar figure that we have between the two? I just didn't see it on the slide. So the total, the total funding of sorry, do you want me to can I say that or do you need six five five six one point eight six million dollars total funding available for the for this area? Um we I think the number that CT had was like two hundred thousand dollars for shelters. We will most likely go for the full amount um, because we're assuming that 25% um, of the total amount will go down for ODOT administrative costs. So the, when you take 1.1 million, you can take 250 or 300 thousand dollars right off the top. And we have also in our mobility um, budget, we have some funding that we budgeted for mobility projects that would like match that local match requirement. Oh, okay. That 1.8 you're talking about is that different yeah. than this 1.1? 1.1. 1.1. Yeah. Okay. 1.086556. 6.27 local match requirement. Tyler, I have a question on the um, the second round in 2000, 2024, um, and ODOT talked about it, and you mentioned it also earlier that there is another round assumed. Is yes. that within this funding pot or a separate additional funding pot? Funding pot. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I think uh, my assumption is that's going to be really geared towards because all the small cities and county, rural counties are eligible for these funds as well. And I'm assuming that the vast majority of those communities will not be submitting this round because they're not in a place to have an application ready. And so I think it's to give time for ODOT to work with that, you know, that bigger group of eligible entities to seek that in, you know, next spring. Is the idea that this application would be it for five years? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I think we are directing staff, maybe, maybe I'm looking for a motion, we're going to ask staff to put together both letters of support um, for the city event slash commute options project proposal and also the CET proposal. Um, for myself right this moment, I will say, you know, that does not give me heartburn knowing that CET is not trying to get the full amount and we can essentially put it in ODOT's hands if they are going to fund both of those um, entirely or partially. So um, Phil, I'm looking at you. Ari, does that sound like what we're looking for from the staff for our next meeting? Yeah, I mean, the only other thought is whether, I mean, there was some discussion, Eric mentioned last time, I think, the, Possibility that some shelters might also receive funding from other sources, or is that is this we'll be pursuing this as an ongoing thing? We're also going to be rolling out shelters to Redmond, Madras, 
So we'll have to pursue separate funding for those. So this is going to be a long term project. All right. Thoughts? Do we need a motion or, or just a head nod? I think we, I think a head nod's fine. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Really excellent questions. And again, this is, these are the applications that need to be done next month, um, which brings me back to the money that, um, again, does not have to be spent until next year, which is that COVID funding. We have been working diligently on distributing that money. We did great at the last meeting. We awarded some to CET and some to City of Bend. And um, specifically still in front of us is the proposal to fund the transportation infrastructure that is associated with those core and housing work projects on Simpson Avenue. So that suggestion is still out there. That proposal is still out there. And then we also heard from ODOT. Um, they um, proposed the idea of simply having a reserve that we don't need to get all of this money out the door at this moment in time. So how about if we go back to that core um, housing works project. Yeah. Um, and we really do. We just have a few minutes here and I'm thinking, yeah, maybe we can figure one more out. You know, Tyler? Cameron has her hand up. Cameron? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the last discussion on the carbon reduction program um, uh, targets and everything wrapped up so quickly. I didn't hear what you directed staff to do. Sure. Thank you, Cameron. We have directed staff to put together two letters of support for the two proposals we heard. And at the next meeting, we will officially vote on submitting those letters. Thank you. That helps. Of course. Thank you, Cameron. All right. Housing Works and Core. Um, Tyler, it seems like we had an update. We've been hearing more. Yeah. And I see we've got Jackie from Core, or at least the top half of her face is with us here today. Hi, Jackie. Hi, everyone. Yes. Jackie, Thanks for having me again. Do you want to walk through the three slides? Yeah, sure. And I'll keep it really short um, because you heard a lot about our project, even in this last discussion. Um, so do you have our slides, Tyler, or do you want me to share my screen? Oh, you're on it. So really quick, right? This is our current condition on Simpson Avenue, where on one side, OSU's new campus is coming in. On the other, we have 99 units of affordable housing coming in. Um, so this, as we all know, is sub quality. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we're looking to transform this streetscape into a 10 foot public sidewalk that will meander around um, ASI like um, boulders and um, existing trees. Nice landscaping buffer, um, followed by a six inch, um, six foot bike lane, and then where we have our cars. Um, so this proposal is essentially investment ready and we can just jump to the next slide real quick. So Tyler has a much more detailed budget, but I wanted this um, group to be able to see exactly what we're asking for. Um, so you're in a very unique position right now. So this project um, is expected to get state funding next week. So if we were awarded funds through Bend MPO, this project would be 100% funded um, and it's shovel ready, ready to go starting this summer. Um, what that really means is that you have an opportunity to have citywide impact on Simpson Avenue through this project. And I love the partnerships that we're already starting to work with, with the city of having these hubs of these carbon, the carbon reduction program. Um, our design has been um, supported by both Ben Bikes and Commute Options um, as the best infrastructure investment um, for Simpson Avenue. 
So um, our total request um, is $657, um, $621. Thank you, Jackie. And okay. that would, that is the total amount you need for Correct. all of that infrastructure. Yes, thank yes. you. And Tyler, will you remind us what the total amount of money we have left is? $880,857. Thank yes. you. Thank you. So if we were to fund it, fund this entirely, we would still have $220,000 remaining yes. from this funding. So is this current estimate, it's different than the initial one of 836,000? Yeah, so um, Tyler asked us to remove the street trees, which we did. Sorry, to remove which? Street trees, like trees. The, the ones that are in, the, sorry, the page that I have still has them on there, 92,400. Um, uh, so unfortunately, I don't know what budget you're looking at. Um, this oh, budget it's on the screen to... too. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, the budget we're looking at um, definitely mm -hmm. shows $92,000 for street trees. Oh, on the housing work section? Sim Simpson East section. Yeah. Yeah, so core took our street trees out. We can take those street trees okay. out as well. Oh, so that would drop down by 92,000, another 92,000. Yeah, and again, I would use the budget that we sent Tyler. This budget condensed a lot of things so that we could fit on the slide for you all. But sure. I don't know if you all have that in front of you. If not, I can pull it up. A quick question. What are the project limits? Excuse me? What are, what are the limits of the project? Um, what do you mean by limits? Washington, oh, yeah. 15 feet from Mount Washington. Washington. Oh, okay. Okay. It's the full, it's the full section, yeah. not just, not just like the middle of the section. No. Yeah, it's, no, it's, seven, it's, yeah, okay. it's seven acres between the um, Mount Washington and um, right where at past 17th. I just we're not mobile home park. We're not going to have a changing streets section. No, that segment between the no roundabout. The, okay, pay per curb is not changing. Is that what you mean? No, I just meant it. Are we is the improvement oh. for the entire length yes. of that area, or are we just doing one section that we're uh, going back the to a different entire length of that area? Okay, yeah, yeah. great question. One question that raises what what's going on between 14th and 15th? I, I can't really. Uh, between 14th and 15th, and this is just my memory from the presentation, will be a trail path access that would connect this meandering multi-use trail over to the 15th Street Neighborhood Greenway. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember from last, the last presentation. Yeah, there's a complete network of shared use path on the south side between Mount Washington and 14th. And on the north side, it gets us to 15th Street Neighborhood Greenway. And there's, and there's sidewalk is there to the feet. And then yeah, there's sure. sidewalk adjacent to Pine um, um, Pine Mountain Sports about the house. department. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Is this proposal and there's switch and the others? Can we do we have time to jump through the other discussion items at this point. Well, sure, that. let's just look at what the other proposals, I mean, just honestly, briefly, briefly, because my memory was the other proposal was hold the money. Well, I think what we had was, and hopefully Janet is still on, Janet approached me with uh, kind of a last minute request for uh -huh. traffic signal, funding for one of the traffic signals. Oh, I remember that, yeah. So, but last minute because it started having some issues. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's less than $100,000. Do I remember? It was like $60,000 for a single um, intersection improvement up at Roball. So, Janet, do you want me just to kind of start walking? I'll pull up the first slide. Um, honestly, Tyler, um, uh, you know, I don't see us ready well yeah no maybe we could do this one this very moment yeah 
I could go through it super quick. Um, what this is, is we had a number of different signal um, uh, design projects that we were uh, potential candidates for this funding, but we were fortunate to get STBG funding for those, for our, our Franklin Wall and Bond in Oregon um, Wall and Bond signal redesign. So next on our list is Robo Hunnell, and I'd been working with ODOT and our internal budgets to try and do something and with the North Corridor project that wasn't working out, but still looking for opportunities. And then last week we got the notice that one of our detector failed. Um, and so it got us thinking this, this signal is doing a lot of work and will be pretty critical as the whole North Corridor construction is happening and also pretty important as that area develops as far as walking and biking and it's missing some things. So ODOT, um, working with ODOT, they were able to contribute funding to install the new controller so we have a better operating ability. Um, we're going to fund... Um, we have $37,000 that I can put towards something at the signal. Uh, we're, our key feature being the detection and the uh, it has the old doghouse less safe signals that you have a green ball. You can barely see it in this picture, but it's the green ball with the sign that you have to read that says left turn yield. Oh. But people driving up, right, don't see the arrow definitively telling them that warning you, you have to yield. So they see the green ball. So there's... Uh, a number of crashes that we think are attributable to that. Um, and so if we have an opportunity to get up to $50,000 uh, additional funding, we the city also will uh, try and work on the ADA ramps with our own crew to save some money. Um, we can upgrade this within the next year as part of or probably before the fall, if all goes well. So it'll be in place as all the detours are happening. Thank you, Janet. Um, okay. Uh, again, no pressure. We you know, with the, with <laughs> it's just you know we've spent time on this and we've discussed. So that signal seems very specific, limited amount. I wouldn't have any angst about deciding on that, even though this is the first we've heard about it. It also would be fine with me if we just leave that. Because no matter everything that's in front of us still doesn't spend all the money, right? So how about that and core housing works um, contribution? We have heard about that and been thinking about that for a while. If just, anyone, um, wanna, go ahead, Jack. Sorry, I just want to get you an accurate number. And I just looked at the budget I sent Tyler. If you remove that street tree, you're at five, eight, nine, three, seven, zero, and 16 cents. I don't think the chat, I was going to chat that, but I'll just email it to Tyler. So 589,370 and 16 cents. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. I was going to suggest a motion that said not more than 658,000 after street trees have been removed from the budget. But now we can say 589,370 dollars and 16 cents. Yeah. Anyone want to make that motion? I'd like to make that motion. Excellent. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Second? I'll second. And we have a second from ODOT. Excellent. Motion on the floor is for $589,370.16 that will help core and housing work do the transportation improvements so we get more than 90 units of affordable housing. All in favor say aye. Aye. I mean, I have to, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm not thrilled about painted bike lanes on Simpson. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that Ben Bikes would support that too. I mean, it's a 35 mile an hour street. Uh, I mean, there's elements of this that I'm not comfortable with. And I don't necessarily see the system wise benefit. I do support the project, but I, I don't know that I'm 100% on board with um, the full amount, but um, I, I don't know that my vote is actually pivotal here. Um, well, it kind of is. If the two of us don't agree, well, no. Even if the even if we're abstaining, we still have two of our three. I think um, I, I just I saw some of the discrepancies here. I mean, walking in the one hundred seventy nine thousand dollar discrepancy 
from the 836,711 that was estimated before. I mean, that's what's on the previous slide. I just, I feel like it's, I just don't feel like the number, I don't know. It's a lot to decide with, uh, without being very deliberate. So I would like, I would like a little more time, but I understand the project is shovel ready. And um, I mean, I think if, if you're comfortable and, and you're comfortable and you're comfortable, I'm, I, I'm supportive. Well, I, a, a question kind of back at you then, if you, if you think the like, if you're looking for a separated or bicycle facility or, or something else along that line, um, this there's is a city code issue. I know, seriously, there, there, <laughs> there's nothing saying that the city couldn't yeah. help support this with yeah. additional funds to make those improvements. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I too, Ari, um, you know, if, if you had concerns about that multi-use path, mm. now, absolutely, that is what's getting actually built. But as far as the curb to curb width of that road, that's not going to change um, buffering or um, literally separating that bike line is an improvement that can be done later in time is kind of what I'm thinking. That's fair. Okay. We have a motion and a second on the floor. And if I could just say, yep. I, I think the system-wide benefit uh, that we're talking about here is this, this is not just about this affordable housing development. This is about the north entrance to OSU Cascades. I think so too. I, I mean, that that's what makes me feel like there is broader significance to this project. I agree with that. Yes, that that relieves my concern that it's a very targeted neighborhood in the city of and you know that it's it's across the street from our university. So I do. I think it has more regional implications. Yeah, okay. I agree. And I think there's also some other connections there to trails that are pretty critical. Um, so I just, I just I think it's my own uh, I needed more time than I would than I had for this, and uh, so thank you for letting me express those. Of and, uh, but I'm I'm ready to support. All right. So all in favor? Aye. 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 That is unanimous. That's great. Um, how about fifty thousand dollars for that signal? Anybody want to make that motion today, or do we want to think about that one until our next meeting? Is that one time sensitive. It's not working. <laughs> yeah, when the when the one loop's not working, it's very sensitive. And another thought came to mind after uh, the initial conversation, and and with Eric and CET here in the room, Janet mentioned the North Corridor project. It's adding a bus stop. I forget what that route number is, Eric, but mm -hmm. there's a bus stop being added right next to that intersection on Roble. Mm -hmm. So as far as that overall safety and operation of that, yeah, and intersection, yeah, and, and along with it with. Um, the detours we're going to have in place while we're doing work on a highway 20 and highway right, 97 right this is very important i would be happy to support it yeah same so are we supporting the loop or are we supporting transit this will facilitate this yeah, no, changes it's this traffic, traffic signal it's needs okay. needs of the traffic signal i just when we were talking the crash history there and the safety of that intersection. I remember that bus stop being added there with the Oda North Corridor project. But over this next what, year and a half or two, that intersection is going to be pivotal or key with detours for the 97 work, the Highway 20 work. Yeah. Um, so, we'll, yeah, we don't like having a signal out there having issues with loop detection and things when it's. No, I, 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 I'm fully tracking that. I mean, you know, I, I'm in that intersection on a regular basis. I want it to be working. I don't want anybody to be crashing. I, I get. I do have a little bit of question about just kind of is this the appropriate fund source for that project? Um, so why don't we just go ahead? We'll just table that suggestion for right now. We're over time at this moment. Um, I kind of had that same. But you know, my question was focused on. How is it? How's the request only $50,000? You can't do anything to a signal with 50. And what was just described is oh, it is some money is coming from ODOT, some is coming from City of Bend. This is kind of a fill the gap funding to be able to fix and prove that light. Yeah, we're going to put that one on. Yeah, That's fine. I can, no, we just heard there. about this. That's just fine. 
Great apologies. I have to pick up uh, nine something. little girls for third grade soccer. So <laughs> That's, uh, great. That's great. That's great. There's uh, no apology. We're running late. Um, Ari, I will just tell you that the next MPO consortium statewide, we're going to have it in person. Um, I think it'll probably be in Eugene. Is that right? Or Salem, maybe? Yeah, we're thinking in the Valley. But any in, any interested members, if you know, want to participate or zoom in, it'll be a hybrid meeting. And our next meeting for the MPO is April 19th at noon. Thank you, Ari. I'm sorry we ran late. Um, and then, um, Phil, I was just going to ask if today's conflict was just a random conflict or if a 1230 start would be better for you. Uh, this the this shoot space and water collaborative I, working group, I believe, is moving like it's only every other month. Okay. But it is, uh, I believe they are moving to this 10 30 to 12 30 slot. Okay. Um, so I didn't. So Tyler. No, I missed that conflict when we were discussing this. Yeah, don't but, worry about it. No, it's fine. So Tyler, maybe we'll consider moving our start time to 12 30. To better accommodate our um, Deschutes County representative, would you mind um, sending out an email regarding that um, doodle poll? Maybe, do, I don't know if it needs to be a doodle poll, but we'll just check. And then the other thing we would need to check is the availability of this room if we change that time by a half an hour. So I'm not making any promises, Phil, but you know, I would be more than happy to see if we can make that accommodation. Let me confirm that. With of course, yeah, great. Okay, so that's just something we'll think about. Um, but as of now, our next meeting is the 19th at noon and um, just be sure to check where we are meeting. It's probably gonna be right here. Last call for public comments. And thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for those extra minutes. Really important decisions, really good work, actual money we have to help with um, transportation needs in our community. I hope you all feel like this is a rewarding job to get to participate in. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody, Mo meeting adjourned. Oh, goodness. So, John, yes. I met with Carl yesterday oh, cool. about the idea of fully and